This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Hey, welcome all our Torah Anytime uh, viewers. Okay, so tonight we are continuing with the topic on proving that the Torah is divine. So what we're doing today is something called Torah Codes. For whoever is not familiar with Torah Codes, it's hidden codes that are hidden in the Torah. The way to, you know, to think about it this way is, uh, imagine you are a spy and you want to send a message to your mother country, motherland, right? Whatever you want to call it, right? Assuming you're Russian. So, um, because there's, is there any other, there's no mother USA, right? It's only mother Russia, right? Everyone else, I think, is male. Um, so, in any case, you're going and you're, you're a spy, you want to send your message to a, your, your country. Now, think about it in the olden days. You want to send a letter, you want to send some sort of document. You can't just re- say straight out, hey, by the way, you know, they have nukes in this location, and this in this location, and this in this location, be careful of this, because then they're just going to, you know, intercept it. And they're not, it's not going to uh, be successful, it's not going to reach its destination. So, what you can do is do something through codes. You could, you could, uh, um, hide a message through code. So it could be like, hey mom, everything is great down here in Siberia, I'm having a blast, and you know, and just continue writing a normal letter, and then you tell them beforehand, every tenth letter, circle that letter. And then afterwards, forget about everything else that I wrote, everything else at the end, that's how you know my, my, my real message is, is that you circle every tenth letter, and then you'll find out my real message in there. So that is the idea behind codes. So before we even go and explain it, let me, here is, here is an understanding of, of how it works. So I'm going to be standing up, and I, I think I'm going to do standing up and down in this um, class a lot. So also for all those audio people on the virtual world, this class might be a little bit easier to actually uh, watch. So this is... Uh, um, let me show you how this is, re- this is read, and then I'll explain it. So you can see in the front, and, be- and stay with me. This is the form we used, we used for finding codes, and I added letters, letters precisely placed to form a longer try. Did you guys get that? So basically this idea is, is that you're taking the, the paragraph and instead of putting it in, um, in normal sentence format where you spread out the letters, you put, everything co- you put everything combined together. The reason why this is better is that it's easier to see the codes when you put it this way. So this is where, um, you know, the, the, uh, we'll speak about this. This is uh, actually a form that, a, uh, I guess a code that the, one of the people that, that created uh, the Torah codes put together. So... When you look over here, there are 10 letters across, and we don't care how many down, but there's 10 letters across, which means is that you see over here food in green, and you see over here order in yellow. So these are codes that are hidden inside this, 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 um, you know, this, this paragraph, and it's hidden at exactly a, a uh, letter skip of 10 letters. So look, the F, you count 10 letters, you get to the O. You count another 10 letters, you get to the O. You count another 10 letters, you get to the D. The, and this is a... a uh, I guess a term that they use a lot is ELS, equidistant letter skip. The reason why this is important is that this means something to us. If I were to say, if you count the first five letters, you're going to get a I. And you count another 12 letters, you get a S. You count another 12, uh, 15 letters, you're going to get an R. And then so on and so forth, I'm going to say 15 letters, 17 letters, 16 letters, and it's going to spell Israel. Wow, code, you know, it's unbelievable. That doesn't mean anything, because you could find anything with that. But if you find something that's equidistant letter skip, which means is that it's, it's skipped precisely at the same intervals every single time to form a word, that shows something that is more... Um, that is, that is more impressive, if we can start. So here you see over here, this is food and this is order. Um, it's almost like an American, you know, created this, right, to order food. So uh, you put over here food and order to, as in 10, the uh, letter skip. Over here, you see over here, it's backwards, it says roses. For the women, right? This is, uh, yeah, this is obviously it's in pink, you know. Um, so you have over here roses backwards. Roses over here is an equal distant letter skip of a negative 11. Why do I say negative 11? Negative 11 means that it's going backwards. And it's 11, as you see, one, it's, one, it's always one off. And we know that it's 10 over here, so anybody who knows simple math, it's always going to be one off. Depending if you go 11, 12, it's going to be two off, and so on and so forth. This is the idea, and this is how we're going to see a lot of the, of the letter skips that we are going to be uh, looking at today. It's going to be more or less, and we're going to try to do it as much as we can in this format, because it's easier to see it, it's easier to observe it, it's easier to understand it. So, this is the idea, uh, this is the idea behind it. Now, 
when you're going and when let's say you open up a, a paper and on this paper let's say it's a, I don't know a, the a New York Times you're opening up this New York Times and you see over there that in every five letters it spells out your first name and your last name now the first thing that you're going to do when you think about that is going to be like wow that's that's pretty cool but it's probably a, probably a, you know some sort of you know crazy coincidence but imagine you open up the paper next week and the next week, you have also, at a five equal distant letter skip, you have also your first name and your last name. This time, they'll throw in your address also. Now you're going to start being like, okay, something is going on up here. Imagine this goes on for 10 weeks in a row. Are you going to think that this happened by chance, or are you going to think that somebody actually went and placed this there? You'll think that somebody actually went and placed this there. Which means is the more impressive the code is, the more unlikely it is that it just happened by chance, and somebody actually had to go and, and, uh, and put that inside over there. So... The Vilna Gaon writes, and he says that the, he, wrote, he writes this in uh, Sifra Ditz Neusa. He says that everything is hidden in the Torah. Not only everything is hidden in the Torah, you think like, okay, basic, you know, grand ideas. Every single person in the entire world, forever that was ever created, is in the Torah. From the beginning, from, from the beginning of his life till the end of his life. Not just a general idea, but every single detail of your life is hidden inside the Torah somehow. The, um, and the Ramak, or Moshe Cordovero, writes in Pardes Rimonim that, you know, some of the secrets of the Torah is something called Diluk Otiyot. Diluk Otiyot is a skipping of letters. And that's what we're going to be dealing today, the skipping of letters with their codes that are hidden in the Torah. Now, we're going to show how impressive this is. And it's really, it's, it's mind-boggling how impressive this is. That it's not, it's not going to leave you an, even an iota of doubt that you would think that it's possible that maybe somebody created the Torah other than a divine being other than God who has to know not only such, such a tremendous amount of information to be able to, to precisely place these codes inside of there, but also had to know the future. There was a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Michal Dov Weismendel, who was, a, uh, he was the head of yeshiva in Czechoslovakia during the Second World War. He used to go and raise money and bribe the Nazis to try to free out uh, the Jews. And what he, he had a phenomenal mind, and what he used to do with his index cards, he took index cards, and he wrote down the Torah similar to something like this, and he would find the codes with just his mental, mental abilities. Now we have a computer, and we're assuming we're going to discuss how the computer came into being, the, the, the computer program, but he was able to go and, and sort of just formulate and, and figure out the codes just with his mental capacity and just with his ability to go and, and, and his understanding in the Torah. In the 1970s, there was a professor by the name of Eliyahu Rips, who went, and he was a professor, professor at the Hebrew University in, in Yerushalayim, and he was very impressed with Rabbi Weissmandel's findings. Rabbi Weissmandel's findings, after he died, his students put together a sefer, a book, that it's called Torah's Chemet. And in there it says a lot of his, his, his findings. So he came across this, and he was very impressed with this, this Eliyahu Rips. And he decided that he is going to go, and he's going to look for things at his own. See if he finds anything. And he found patterns. And when he found patterns, he said, you know, this is something worth investigating. He went and he began working with somebody by the name of Daron Witzum. This uh, Daron Witzum, he, was a, he has a degree in math and physics from the Hebrew University. And they developed a system that will be able to find an equidistant letter skip in the Torah. So they basically placed all the words in the, in the Torah. And they were able to find all the codes based on what the information they put in. They'll say, okay, let's say, uh, find uh, the name Yehoshua in equal distant letter skip of X and Y, whatever, between two, two numbers, it would search the entire Torah and it will tell you where the, those numbers are, are found. If I'm not mistaken, I think that program is for sale, but I'm not sure. Um, I, could, uh, you know, I was giving this class to the guys and they were like, well, they should have an app for this. I'm like, they do, but it probably costs a lot, a lot of money. Because uh, this is a lot of, uh, you know, this is a, a, first of all, it's a very small, uh, you know, um, I guess, niche where people are actually going to go and be like, you know what, I'm going to buy this program. It's something that you actually have to be very interested in and actually to go in. But it is, um, if I'm not mistaken, you, it is, uh, you know, somehow achievable to the, to the general public. I know the Christians got a hold of it, and this is a whole other class in itself and where they took us on a field trip. Um, but anyways, going back to, to the point at hand, they went and they created this program. The, the idea with this, um, with, the, with this program is now we're able to find things that no human mind has the ability to find. Because let's say you're going to go and you're going to want to find something. Where are you going to start counting? Imagine the idea. You want to find your name in the Torah. So let's say your name starts with a Yud. Right? So you're going to see the first Yud, you're going to start counting 10 letters. And then you're going to find another, and then you, you find, let's say, you know, something, your second letter. But then you, you count another 10 letters, and <clears throat> you missed it out. So then you have to start again from a different Yud. It will take you your whole lifetime just to find that one code. But if you have a program, you're able to search anything and everything in an instant of a second. And then you see over here, there's so much codes out there. We are only going to touch the tip of the, of the, just the iceberg, the tip of the surface of where we're actually going to see it. And it's gonna, I'm, I'm telling you this. 
it's going to blow your minds today. It's, it's so unbelievable. So let's start with the, um, the first idea, the first code. The first code, we're going to look at Bereshit. Bereshit, in the beginning, if you see over here, there is, if you go from the first taf in, the, in Bereshit, and you go over here, and you count 50 letters, you're going to get to the Vav into home. You count another 50 letters, you're going to get to the Resh in Vayera, and you count another 50 letters, it's going to get to the He in Elohim. Anybody know what that spells? Torah, right? It spells Torah. The first fifty, the first top, you count fifty letters. It spells an equal distance skip. It spells out Torah. Now, what's so special about the number fifty? The number fifty, first of all, we know is a Yovel. Is a Yovel year. We're going to get to this a little bit later. It's also there was fifty days between the exodus of Egypt to the receiving of the Torah. But also, and the part that we're going to focus very heavily on, there are fifty gates of wisdom. There are fifty gates of wisdom. So let's go on to uh, you know to, to the, the to Sefer Shemos. But I'm going to show it to you over here in a little bit of a different format. And that's going to be in this format because it's going to be clearer and easier to understand. Before that, let me explain to you how, how this format works. So what we see over here is each of, these letter, each of these lines are 25 words. They're 25 words, and here it's easier to see the 50 letter skip. Because you see it's 25, this is, going to be, this is going to be 25, this is going to be 50. Another 25, 50. So you see it's equidistant letter skip of 50 words. And you see how it spells out the entire Torah in 50, in 50 words. So let's go on to, I don't know why I'm bending over, I can do this over here, um, thanks to wireless technology. So here is Shemos. You go to Shemos, the Eile Shemos. You go to the first Taf in Shemot, which is the, the, in the end of Shemot, and you're going to count 50 letters, you're going to get a Vav. You count another 50 letters, you get a Resh. You count another 50 letters, you get a He. It also spells out Torah, also an equal distant letter skip of 50. Pretty cool so far. So maybe you could say it's a coincidence. Maybe somehow it happened. Or maybe the people who created, and I'm using air quotes, the Torah, somehow were able to put this inside over here. Yet for some reason it wasn't found until you know, the, recent, uh, you know, the recent time. Here is Vayikra. Vayikra does not have an equal distant letter skip of 50 to tell you uh, to say uh, the Torah. Rather it has something else. You go from the first Yud of Vayikra. You count eight letters, it gets a hey. Another eight letters gets a vav. Another eight letters gets a hey, and that spells God's name, yud k vav k. This, but this is what we have in Vayikra. We're going to get back to this, and we're going to explain the whole beautiful picture. The next one, which is Bamidbar, which is numbers, you go and you count. This is something very interesting. Over here, you're going to have an equal distant letter skip of fifty, but it's going to spell Torah backwards. And if you see, you go from the first hey of Moshe. You go over here to hey, you count 50 letters, you get a resh, count 50 letters, you get a vav, you count 50 letters, you get a taf over here. It's going to spell backwards, Torah, but again, at 50 letter skip. So now we have two things that we have to, we have to, we have to question and understand. Why Vayikra doesn't have any Torah? Number two, why Bamidbar has it Torah, but it has it in 50, but it's backwards. Why is it backwards? Let's look at Devarim. Devarim is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy has it over here. And it's also in backwards, as you can see over here, it's in backwards, but it's not in 50 letter basket, but rather it's 49. So this is, the th- this is the second question that we have, the third question, I'm sorry, that we have. How come by, by Devarim, it's in equal letter skip of 49 versus 50, and also it's backwards like by Midbar? Okay, so here we have to try to, un- try to understand, and this is where we're going to get into a little bit, yeah, question. How's That's where the program comes in. This, if I'm not mistaken, was, if I'm not mistaken, and I have to look it up, and I should have really looked it up, I think this is Rabbi Weissman Del found, not, not, the pro, not the Torah codes, not the program. Why if I, not to look for the word Torah? That's a good question. He's, he's a very smart man, and he's very well versed in, you know, different, uh, you know, ideas in Judaism, and the mystical Judaism, and he knew what to look for. So, um, yeah. So, okay. So now the first idea that, that we have to first try to understand and uncover this is the authorship of the Sefer of Devarim, the Sefer of Deuteronomy. How was it written? Was it written like the first four books of, of Moses? Now, if you're a biblical scholar, I guess the right word would be Talmud Chacham, but uh, let's say you know, let's say your, your specialty is the Hamishei Chum Torah. You know by heart, you know everything. You realize that the book of Devarim is written differently, slightly different than the first four books of, of, of the Torah, first four books of Moses. You, and, and it's something very interesting. The first four books of Moses were written on a higher level of very bad translation, but I'm going to use it, spirituality or prophecy or divine inspiration. All terrible in, you know, explanations that I'm giving, but think of it, it was written on a higher level. Devarim was written on a slightly lower level than that. Now, why was it written that? In fact, there are many, um, there are many ideas, and there's, there's, there's a lot to speak about this, and we don't have the time to discuss it today, but like the authorship of the Sefer Devarim, Moshe had a very, very strong um, 
say in it. Sort of to think of like a prophet. You know that prophets wrote the prophecy. The 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 prophets wrote the book of the the Nevi'im in Tanakh. Sort of that's how Moshe put in the Sefer of Dvarim. So you know how, let's say for example, Sefer Yoshua was written through prophecy, but it was written not directly like we had the five books of Moses, the, and the Sefer Dvarim was written somewhat similar to the way that the Sefer Yeshua was written. Not at all close, but somewhat similar. Now, I'm hoping that you're confused at this point, because it's, it's, what I'm saying is not clear. So I'm going to try to clarify it, and, and this is a very, very hard uh, you know, thing, and I'm going to try to say it as clear as possible. There's a lot to speak about this. The Bible critics go crazy over this, um, this idea. So, and the, there's, there's all very simple answers, but you have to have a little bit of a deeper knowledge on the way the Torah works in order to understand what I'm going to say. So I'm going to try to say it as, as simple as possible that I can. So now, the idea, and the morale explains like this. The morale explains that when you have two people giving each other, one person is giving a gift to another person, if they're on the same level, then the, there is a, a linear dimension. There's one dimension going on, the giver to the receiver. But if they are on different levels, it's very hard to go and accept the gift. Think of a ver- another bad example. is Imagine a king gives a gift to a peasant. Now, it's a, there are two different worlds that they're living in. Like, you know, he's going to give him a priceless painting. He's like, I just want bread and milk. You know, like, he's, you're talking about two different levels of an understanding. So in order to get something, if there are two different levels, in order to get a, a parallel, you know, level, or even a close um, relationship with that gift giving, it has to be on a somewhat on a similar plane, on a similar dimension. So, bear with me, it's going to get very clear shortly. The... The morale goes and explains that the first four books of, Mo- of, of Moses, uh, the, the, you know, Bereshish, Shmos, Shmos, Vayikra, and Bamidbar, was given to Moshe as Moshe was acting as a non-interactive interface, just accepting whatever he was given. The Sefer Devarim, he was acting as an interactive interface. The idea of this is that in order to make, and that's why, you know, Devarim is known as Mishnah Torah. Have you guys ever heard of that? Devarim is known as Mishnah Torah. We know right on Hoshana Rabbah, they go, why do they say Devarim? Devarim is sort of a review of the Torah, per se. And it's a, why, why is it a review of the Torah? It's saying it in a more of a understanding that the human population can get it. Because imagine you have God, and you have the human, human people, which is getting, receiving the Torah, two completely different dimensions. One's infinite, one's finite. So it's too, in order to get something, you have to have sort of a parallel, sort of a connection. So God gave the first four books of Moses in a, on, a, on, a, on a very high level. But, this, but the, the fifth book had to be on a sort of in a more, on a more balanced scale that the people would be able to accept it, understand it, and be able to internalize it better. This also led a precedent for all the future prophets and how they, they um, you know, how they received the prophecy and how they wrote the, the you know, the, the, um, the Tanakh. True. So. And even in the Tanakh, you have it like that. It's not going to be simple and straightforward, which we'll probably speak out maybe, you know, when we speak about the oral law. There's a reason for that as well. The, okay, so now we have, to, we have to clarify something over here. This is, the, this, is the, this is the most difficult part of the class. This is why I put it in the beginning, because uh, while people still have the you know, mental capacity and they're able to concentrate a little bit. Even though, so some people might say, hey, listen, if Moshe, if, if Moshe wrote the Torah and Moshe wrote Sefer Devarim, so maybe Sefer Devarim should really be a part of the prophets. But really, no, it's not. It's part of the Chamsheh Chum And to understand this, we look at the Gemara in Yevamot. Gemara in Yevamot, in page 49b, goes and explains like this. It says that the prophets, there's level of prophecy. Some prophets are higher than the others. Some prophets are lower than the others. When a, the, the level of prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu, of Moses, was the highest possible, was one of the highest. And how do they explain it? A regular prophet is able to see his prophecy through a dirty glass. So you're able to see, imagine, you're, you know, you're, able, you're looking through a dirty glass, you're able to see, but things are a little bit fuzzy. But, but Moshe was looking through a clear glass. How clear was it? it? His prophecy was clear as if a scribe was going and dictating exactly what was telling him to be written. Which means Sefer Devarim was written in the same high, you know, you can think of it on the, on the, on the high level that it belongs in the Hamshei Chum Torah and not in the level of the prophets. A little bit clearer for now. Okay. So now the idea behind the, the transition between the Hamshei Chum Torah and the, the Tanakh, there was, that's where Sefer Devarim comes in. It also comes in as also a, um, a interactive interface where you're able to go and put it on the same parallel uh, you know, level to where we can, we can uh, 
associate with it on a much easier level. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't associate with, with the first four books of Moses. This just means that we're able to internalize everything. It becomes, the present becomes more something that we can internalize. I did a terrible job in explaining this, but do you understand it? Okay, you understand it? Okay, fine. It, when you try to explain morale, it's very, very deep, very, very philosophical. Um, and one of my things that I, that I try doing, and this is what I try, you know, this is what I tell people, you know, when people, I, I've had people ask me, the speakers, can you listen to my speech and tell me how, you know, give me William Pointers. I, you know, I did that as well also. So one of the things that I try to do very, very hard is no matter how difficult the concept is, you have to explain it simply. If you can't explain it simply, that means you don't know it. But there are some concepts that is very hard to explain simply because it's very abstract. So I'm hoping that I try to explain it simply as, as, and, and as understandable that I can, but this is, this is a very, very important concept uh, to understand. Like the first part is like more like what's over your head. But, this one but, it, but technically it wasn't over your head. Yeah. But it wasn't because we could still relate to it, we could still internalize it, but that's, you know, the, the package was together, was, was part of the Hamshei Hamshei Now, Now, um, okay, so the... I think if I should go in and even explain this. You know, being that we're speaking about this now, this is something that I was going to speak about in Bible criticism. I was going to give a class on Bible criticism. This is a, class, this is a topic that, you know, maybe I'll speak about it very briefly now. The end of Sefer Devarim speaks about that Moses died. Moshe Rabbeinu died. So the Bible critics asked people, like, oh, really? Did he write that he was going to die? And then he, you know, finished the Torah and he gave it died? So in fact, this is not the Bible critics that actually, the Gemara in Bava Batra, go in page 15a, goes and brings this down. And it's actually a machokis. Did Moshe really write that he was going to die in the last eight verses? Who wrote that? Maybe Yeshua wrote that. Maybe Rosh wrote it. So there's actually a machokis. One, um, you know, one mandamar, one, one opinion says that he wrote it with tears. Another opinion, which means he wrote it, he knew what he was writing, but he still completed the entire Torah. Another opinion says, no, that he, that he didn't write it, but Yeshua completed the entire, uh, the, entire the rest of the, um, those last eight verses. The Vilna Golan goes and explains it beautifully. He says, really, they're not arguing on each other. They're saying two different opinions and how it happened over the transition of time. And he goes and explains it like this. Moshe, he wrote it, all the letters together. He put it all together in a mystical, Kabbalistic concept. Put it all together. Yeshua went afterwards, and that's why Dima could also mean um, what's, a, what's a good translation of it? Sort of a uh, jumbled, a jumbled, you know, you know they put the words together, but not in the clear fashion that you're able to read it. So Moshe wrote the entire Torah. Yeshua went and then he separated the letters, put it together that it's, uh, that it's uh, readable to, you know, to the general public. So really Moshe wrote it, but Yeshua went and then he separated it, and that's where you see that. But doesn't deny the fact that he also wrote it with tears. There's different opinions in it. That's, it, that's how it is. Uh, that's how we answer that, that idea in, in short. Um, again, Moshe was a prophet. It's not, it wasn't so difficult for him to, you know, to say, you know, this is not something that's so uh, difficult to understand. But again, there's a lot to speak about that. It's not the class uh, you know, at hand, but I wanted to just uh, touch on it very briefly. Um, Bible criticism, yes. Yeah. So... Um, Okay, so now with that information, we can go and try to understand what we're dealing with the Torah codes over here. Now, we said that there are 50 levels of wisdom, right? There's 50 levels of wisdom, that's where we started, that's with 50, uh, you know, equidistant letter skip. But the question is, how many levels of wisdom was Moshe able to get to? Does anybody know? 49 levels of wisdom, very good. 49 levels of wisdom Moshe was able to get to. So now, let's go and go back and try to understand this. Sefer Devarim, right? How many, how, what, was the, what was the equidistant letter skip? 49. Sefer Ba Midbar, Sefer Shemot, and Sefer Bereshit was in equal distance letter skip of 50. Why? These were all given in, from, you know, from, from a higher level, from a 50 level thing. But what about Vayikra? How come you have over there Vayikra, right in the middle of God's name? So, this is something very, very interesting. You look at Bereshit and Shemot. The letters are written the right way, right? They're going, well, you know, if you're English, it's written the wrong way, but if Hebrew, it's written right, right? So it's going from, it's going from left, from right to left, right? The, the letters are going this way. If it's backwards, it's going from left to right. So we have over here, Bereshit and Shemot, the letters are going from right to left facing this way. Sefer Bamidba and Sefer Devarim, the letters are facing this way. Think of it as a menorah, all pointing to one direction. What are they pointing to? The middle book, Vayikra. What's it, Vayikra? Yud Kevav Ketz Hashem's name. What is Vayikra? What is all the essence of Vayikra? Vayikra speaks about the Avodah, the Avodah of the Bet HaMikdash, the things that we need to do on this world. And again, we have the mitzvot and the Torah and Tartuah, but the Vayikra, that's what it speaks about. It's all focused in one letter. It's all focused in one direction. You have the first two books, Bereshit and Shemot, so this is face, this is going, the 50 letter skip is the right way. This is pointing towards Vayikra. But then afterwards, Vayikra, it's got to be pointing backwards. That's why the by midbar and be, and the varim, it's facing backwards, and it's all pointing in that. What? I should have put it in together. I did not. I did not um, uh, put this, uh, you know, together. So that's why it's backwards, all facing towards or towards one thing. Like some think of it like a a menorah. Okay. 
So that was introduction, right? Cool, no? Can you say that this was made up? No. Yeah. The fact that the, the last one goes this way and the first ones go this way and like all that, where does that idea come from? Where does the idea of like the menorah? I, like, I get the Bible quotes, you know, down the word Torah, but how is it translated into that's what it means? This is why it's like this. Oh, where do we get the understanding that it's facing this way? There are different rabbis that I, I've uh, read it. Some of these ideas I put together my, you know, myself, but the majority of them is all taken from other rabbis, or whatever, or whatever, different rabbis who, who showed us how, how it works. Now, in order to understand this, how they got into that idea, we're going to have to speak about the oral law and how they, how, you know, the Shosh Hashem Midrash, I'll turn it in the dresses by him. There's, a, I don't know, 13 homiletical interpretations of the Torah, you know, not that that helps anybody over here, because what is, you know, these things to understand, but, but to understand it is how we, how we go and understand the Torah and how we ex extrapolate words that's wrong but let's keep with that and move forward okay so now um, okay let's go on to the next one so the they made they created right we said um, Eliyahu Rips and Darren Wheatsom went and created this, this, uh, this, this bible code where you're able to type in any information you want and it says find it wherever you want so they did and they did a search the search was fa- as follows the, one of the searches that they did is it says I want the computer to find all appearances all the times that the word Yisrael Israel is written in the first 10,000 words of Genesis, you know, from an equidistant letter skip of 0 to 100. Find all of the times that it's written in the, you understand that, right? So every single time that it's written in equidistant letter skip, anywhere from 0 to 100. So it could be 1, it could be equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, until 99, 100, and so on and so forth. So the computer ran its search, it found it in two places. Only in two places that, it's, that, it, that you find the word Yisrael in equal distant letter skip. And that is an equal distant letter skip of 7 and an equal distant letter skip of 50. And both of them, what's surprising, they're both in the same four verses. Both, and the first, out of all the 10,000 first words, it's all in the same uh, first four verses. Now, what's very interesting, and here it, here it is, and where, if you want to know where it's found, it's found in Genesis chapter 131 to, chapter, uh, to Genesis chapter 2 verse 3. In those, in those verses you have... Both in the entire the entire first ten thousand words only found twice and with an equal distant letter skip of seven fifty both found in the same uh, four verses. So now what's so special about this? And here is, yeah, here's where you can see it. You see this is the equal distant letter skip Yisrael of fifty, and here is in seven Yisrael. Right, one's backwards, one's forwards. Now what's so special about this? Now. If you go and you read over here, what what the, what are these? Uh, what is it referring to? Um, it's uh, you know what, I, I can't stand reading with all these words together. It speaks about Does anybody know what I'm saying? And it, you know the Pasuk? When, uh, very good, Kiddush. We say this on Kiddush on Shabbat. We say this on Shabbat. Now let's stop for a second. I said that there's an equal distant letter skip of 7 and 50. Both those numbers ring a very, very strong bell. In fact, those are only the, no, the only numbers that are associated with Shabbat. This is the Kiddush that we say on Shabbat, on Friday night Shabbat, which by the way, according to the Rambam, it's the biblical commandment, right? Where it says, Zachot Yom Shabbat the Kachot. Where Zachot, you have to actually verbally remember it. Where do we do that? On Friday night. That's where the biblical commandment of remembering it. And we say this as the Kiddush on uh, Friday night. So, there's something very interesting. 7 and 50, I said the equal distance landscape. What's 7? Seven? 7 days a week. What else? 7 Shemitah. Shemitah is the Shabbat for the land. What about 50? Yovel. So, what's Yovel? Yovel, it's seven, level, seven things of Shemitah, where the, where the land lays rest, the 49th and the 50th level. It's also a Shabbat for the, for the Shemitah over here. So, you have over here, the two occurrences of Yisrael is written in reference to Shabbat in an equal distance skip of Shabbat, of 7 and 50. But now, the question is, what Yisrael is doing with Shabbat? Why do we have the connection of this? We look at the Midrash, in the Midrash uh, Rabbah, in chapter 11. It says that, that God blessed Shabbat. Why did God bless Shabbat? It says something very interesting. It says Sunday had a partner. Who was Sunday's partner? Monday. I said that last week. Yeah. I said this last week? No, you so mentioned it last week. She was so cute. Okay, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> so Shabbat, uh, p- uh, spoiler alert. Okay, Sunday is me- Sunday is partner is Monday. Monday's, I mean, Tuesday's partner is Wednesday. When- Thursday's partner is Friday. Shabbat's going to be like, God, I don't have a partner. So God says, you know what? Yisrael is going to be your partner. I mean, ah, Yisrael is going to be your partner. Now let's go back and look at this, what we have over here. The only time that we have Yisrael in the first 10,000 uh, 10, letters of Genesis 
an equal distance letter skip from 0 to 100 happens twice, and an equal distance letter skip of, zero, of 7 and 50. Both in reference to Shabbat. Both in reference in the, ta- in, the, in the same place where we have the Kiddush on Shabbat. Not only the Kiddush on Shabbat, the biblical Kiddush that we have to do on Shabbat on Friday night. Both of them are associated with Yisrael because Yisrael is the partner with Shabbat. So we see that over here. How in heaven's name is this possible to be created just by chance? It's not. Very good. Okay. This, it's going to get better. This is like you really need concentration. I feel like I'm right. <laughs> but when you hear it, when you understand it, that's why, imagine I would do this without a, without a visualization. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to have it without, without very, the visualization. Okay. So you guys know who the Rambam was? I would hope so. Right? Maimonides, right? Not the hospital. Um, or like many other things that he's named after. But um, the Rambam, Maimonides, so... They went, the, if I'm not mistaken, I think the, the Nach, Ramban, Nachmanides went and he, and he attributed the Rambam in this verse in the Torah. Like he says, like, where do we see Rambam in the Torah? He says we attributed him in this verse in the Torah. Here it is. Exodus chapter 11 verse 9. Vayomar Hashem el Moshe. And Hashem said to Moshe, Lo yishma alechem paro. Paro is not going to listen to you. Leman revot moftai be'eret Mitzrayim. So that I could increase my wonders in the land of Mitzrayim. Now, if you take the acronym, the acronym is the first letter of every word, of Rabot Moftai Be'eret Mitzrayim, you have over here Resh Mem Bet Mem. Rabot Moftai Be'eret Mitzrayim spells out the Rambam. This spells out the Rambam. Where did the Rambam live? He lived in Egypt. Right? He, he was born in Spain, but then he had to move in Egypt. What he became in Egypt? He became a, he became a doctor. Not only a doctor, he became one of the greatest uh, you know, doctors. Rabot Moftai, the wonders, the wonders. Well, the, the Rambam created such wonders in, uh, brought forth such wonders in, in Mitzrayim, in Egypt. Besides that, we know that his you know, he, he put together the Mishneh Torah. Mishneh Torah is a 14-volume work of codifying all the halachot, all the laws of the Torah. He put it together in a 14-volume book, and we use it very, very strongly. It was based off the Shulchan Arucha with the halachot that we have over here. Um, the, if I'm not mistaken, the Yemenites, uh, the, you know, the, they use very strongly the halachot of the Rambam. Every single Bet Midrash in the world that's legitimate has a Rambam inside over there. Rambam is used everywhere. It's really Moftai. It's really the wonders that he had over here in Mitzrayim. So how... A pro, a, you know, apropos it is that the Rambam, who lived in Mitzrayim, who also put out one of the time, is written about in, 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 uh, in the Torah about Mitzrayim. But that's not even the cool part. The cool part is this. So now, they went, and they wanted to search, okay, what was the Rambam's, you know, main, main work? Mishneh Torah. It says, let's search for Mishneh Torah. Maybe Mishneh Torah is written in codes and hidden in this verses. So they went, and they searched, and they found it. In 50 letter skip, you have over here, from the men from Moshe, you count, from the, same, from the same verse, by the way, over here. You count from the memory of Moshe. You count, fifth, you count uh, 50 letters, you get a shin. You count another 50 letters, you get a nun. You count another 50 letters, you get a hey. That spells out Mishneh. Well, the 50 is used a lot. Yeah, which is why I said, well, you know, the, the 50 gates of wisdom, which is why we brought that first. You have over here Mishneh. But what about Torah? We Mishneh Torah. It's not just Mishneh. So you scroll down a little bit, and you see over here, also in 50 letter skip, you see over here Torah. Also an equal distance letter skip of Torah. The question is asked, though, What's up with the big skip? You know, if we're already doing the codes, yeah, if God's already placing over here, couldn't he put them closer together? Why is it such, so, so, um, you know, so spread apart? So imagine I would go and I would start counting from this letter, from after the hey, from after Mishneh Torah, all the way until the Torah starts over here, and I would count how many letters? Can you guess how many letters it would be? 613 letters. Really? 613 wow. letters between oh, Mishneh and between Torah is exactly 613 letters. What was the Rambam's Mishneh Torah? It was clarifying, the codifying the 613 mitzvot. So hence over here, it's very obvious now that it's 613 letters splitting between Mishneh and, Mish- and, and Torah. Now when the Torah was written, right? This is in Exodus, this is in Shemot. When the Torah was written, was the Rambam alive yet? No. Talking about 2,500 years roughly after the Torah was given. Now let's say you claim, uh, these, you know, the people that claim that the Torah was made up the Torah could not have been made up before the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Torah, right? So, and the Septuagint came, what is it, between 1,000 to 1,500 years before the Rambam? So if the people created that, how did they figure this out? How did they know about the future? And they put it inside over here. Can it make, does it make any logical sense that anybody other than a God or divine being that not only has infinite power to be able to go and put secret codes in the Torah, but also know the future and put the stuff that didn't even happen yet. That what the Rambam was able to, was able to, to, uh, to bring out over here. So, 
This just it just it's so unbelievable. By the way, the likelihood of all this stuff is like one in eighty six, one hundred eighty six million. Um, okay, so now let's go on to the next one. The next one is. It would be so cool if you had a pointer. I know, <laughs> like a laser. You could use a bamboo stick. Yeah, the you know. Uh, <laughs> um, you know what? That actually will help me. Is that? Could someone pass me one of those? I don't, won't have to actually stand up. If that if that works, that's a good idea. Okay. If this is like you know some ancient Chinese bamboo, you know each one is worth six hundred thousand dollars. We're using it as a pointer. So the truth is, no, this is better. Okay. This is this is better. Right. Oh, this is actually very good. Okay. This is excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. So all right. So now we have over here, then it leaves me the problem. What do I do this when I'm not talking? I'm going to use it as my staff. Okay. So now, the, it's hard to take me seriously with the bamboo. All right. All right. So, okay. We know in Genesis, right? In Genesis chapter, chapter, okay. In Genesis uh, um, chapter 28, verse 16, it says that Yaakov went and he laid down. And he went to sleep. And he had a dream. And in the dream, he had angels going up and going down. And then he woke up and he says, Oh, surely God is in this place. And Rashi says over there, What is this referring to? Where was he sleeping? On Har Moriah, which is the place where we have the Bet HaMikdash. Now they went and they took this, this area, which is in... Um, oh, it doesn't say it over here. In Ge- this is Genesis chapter, um, chapter 28. And... They went and they searched some, some words that are associated with Migdash. And they searched for a few things. They searched, and you see over here, you look over here, this is an equal distant letter skip of 26. By the way, 26 is the same numerical value of God's name. You have over here an equal distant letter skip, Tzion. Right? You also have here an equal distant letter skip of 26, Makom. And if we go down a little bit, you have an equal distant letter skip over here of ha, HaTorah. And you also have over here an equal decimal letter skip of, of 26, Migdash. All things that are associated with the Migdash, all are an equal decimal letter skip of 26, which is God's name, all in the same area where Yaakov was sleeping in the area of the Beta Migdash that he, was, uh, that he was staying in there. Okay. It is getting late. We're going to have to start picking up the pace over here. We We're just having fun. This is so much fun. Oh, man. Isn't this fun? This is unbelievable. Okay. The, okay. So now, Yosef had a dream, right? We all know this dream. Um, and if we should, we don't, we are going to pretend that we do. Um, and then Yosef had a dream. And in his dream, he had 11 stars and the sun and the moon go and bow down to him. And when he went and he brought this information to his father, his father, you know, said, uh, let me pull this up. This we have to jump back and forth on the PowerPoint. So, here. Here's where it is. Genesis chapter 37, verse 10. This is where he told him the dream. Now, the problem with this dream was, is the 11 stars, okay, we understand that. That's in reference to the 11 brothers. They're going to go and they're going to bow down. The sun is in reference to Yaakov. The moon is in reference to Rachel, his mother. But the question is, is Rachel was not alive anymore. Rachel passed away. Now, where do we see that in the Torah? Look at this, something very interesting. You see where I highlighted the orange? This spells, this is, um, this is Yaakov telling, um, telling Yosef, What is this dream that you, that you dreamt? You look at it from the last letter of Asher. You take the Reish and you continue it. It spells Rachel Meta. Rachel died. He says, how is it possible that the moon is going to bow down to you? However, Rachel passed away. Rachel already died. And we go over here. And we see, so then they, the, you know, they went and they searched in the codes. And they started to search like this. Rachel had a handmaid. Right? Do we know who that handmaid was? 50, oh, very good. Yeah, Billa. The men, you know, like they had 50-50 chance, they picked Zilpa. So they had, um, they had it's Billa. Billa was, Billa was her handmaid. Now, what's very interesting is imagine we're going to go and we're going to search in this area where the Psukim is written about Yosef's dream. We're search, maybe it's written over here something about Billa. And in fact, it's, there is, and here it is over here. You see over here, Bet. And you count 156 letters, you have Lamed. You count another 156 letters, you get a hey. And you count another, I don't have to point, it's just highlighted in yellow. Right, you see it, right? Billa, right? It's another hey. It spells out of here, Billa, in an equal distance letter skip of 156. Now, that's very nice and dandy, but like, what's the 156? Like, why, why am I speaking about 156? So let's look at something very interesting. Yosef, right? Yosef is the, you know, the character over here. So what is Yosef's numerical value of his name? You look over here. The pay is 80, the Samach is 60, the Vav is 6, and the Yud is 10. It equals what? 156. You have Bila, Rachel's handmaid, an equal distant letter skip 
of 156, where you have Bilah written in the same area where it's referenced to uh, that you're going to have the people that are going to bow down, uh, you know, to him. Okay, let's move on. It's getting so late. Oh my gosh. Okay. The, um, how does it get late every single week? Okay. So now, the next one we're going to be dealing with is the, this is in Genesis chapter... 38. This is where it's speaking about the genealogy of King David. Now, we know that Yehuda had Yehuda and Tamar had a, had a son Peretz. From Peretz came all the genealogy of, of eventually came uh, King David. We know that Boaz married Ruth, he, Ruth. Ruth. He had a son Obed, who had a son Yishai, who had a, who had a, who had a son uh, King David. So now this is the area of where it all started. Well, this is where Peretz was born. And this is where it came from him. It came from Yehuda and Tamal. This is in this part in, in Genesis. Now wouldn't it be cool if we were to be able to find all the genealogy of everybody that is associated with King David in this area where his ancestors are King David? So yes, the answer, it would be cool. And not only that, so we look over here. This is the same area. We see over here, you have over here, Bo, uh, wait, what is it going over here? Ruth, an equal distance letter skip of 49. Boaz, an equal distant letter skip of 49. We scroll down in the, same, uh, in the same area. We have over here Ovid, in the same equal distant letter skip of 49. We continue a little bit further down. We have over here Yishai, which is King David's uh, father, also an equal distant letter skip of 49. And we have over here also David, which is also an equal distant letter skip of 49. I just had a thought. Is this really? Oh my gosh. I just saw this right now. This is awesome. It's even in the it's even in the order of where they were born. It's even you have over here Ruth and Boaz is right over here on top. You scroll down, you get over here Ovid. You scroll down more, you get over here Yishai and David, all in the same area, and it's all. Um, I just I just I this I just saw right now. This is in the Met. Wow, this is I'm just you know my mind is now my because all this is new. This is new for me. This is unbelievable. I don't understand. I don't think you understand the the okay. I do. It's really. I have to stand up for this. Okay. Why now we have to understand what's up with the letter forty nine? Why forty nine? Why forty nine of all the things? So we know we count on Sfirah forty. We count forty nine days of Sfirah, right? Forty nine days we count from Pesach to Shavuot. Now, what are we counting on between Pesach and, and Shavuot? And it, well, while we're counting it, we're counting towards Matan Torah, Shavuot. Everyone has a special sfira, right? And what is the 49th one? Malchut Shebe Malchut. What's Malchut Shebe Malchut? Kingdom of king, kingship. What is that more than the king of kings? Which is, you're talking about David Amalek, the forerunner of the, the, the ancestor of Mashiach, the king of kings. You're referring to, you know, obviously, you know, we're not referring to God over here, we're referring to King David. But we have over here the highest level of the kings, where King David, where all his ancestors came to the kings. And over here we have the Mishael that comes over here in an equal distant letter skip of 49. Also, what? Well, yeah, that's where we're getting to. And what are we counting towards? Shavuot. No, that's great, that's great. Shavuot. What's Shavuot? Not only was it the day of his death, but also it was the day that he was born. Yeah, David was born in Shavuot and died in Shavuot. You have over here the entire lineage of, that we have of King David in something we just you know, saw right now, in, in order of the lineage. As we scroll down, we see that the order, this is where it comes from. First off, you know, first you know, the great-grandfather, the grandfather, you know, and so on and so forth. And not only that, it's an equal distance letter skip of 49, which is what we count from, from Pesach to Shavuot, which is the birthday and the death day of the King David, and which is the Svira of Malchut Shebal Malchut, which I can't do this anymore, I'm sorry, I have no idea what to do with this in my hand. Okay, so... Which is something that is so unbelievable, so crazy. How is this possible? This was written before King David. This was written before Boaz, before Ruth, before all of them it was written. And yet, we have it all written here in secret codes. Now you can see, understand, under C, right? Which is the same thing. Well, no, it's not going to be it. Okay, so here's where we see that this is a proof that the Torah is divine. This is the proof that you can't make this stuff up. Well, this is impossible to happen by mistake. So now, the next one I'm going to speak about, this, is a, this we're going to go really fast, because if we go through it, very, it's going to take us a long time. The, in, the, in, the cha- in Genesis chapter 2, um, you know, you go the first th- and, uh, until the first three verses of chapter 3, it speaks about, it says over here, like for example, And God put forth all the trees, all the, uh, the trees, yeah, from the ground. Now, and this is the area that it's referring to, 
where God created the trees. Now, wouldn't it be cool if we would search for all the words that the Tanakh used for different trees, and we would search for it over here, and we would be able to find it over here? And the answer is yes, it would be very cool. And the answer is yes, it's all here. And in fact, there was somebody went and searched, and they, searched, they went through the entire Tanakh, and they saw that there's 25 different words of using for trees. They searched them all in this area, all 25 of them are in here, in equal distant letter skip. And you see over here, uh, we're not going to go through all of them because it's going to take us a long time. We have Chita over here, you have Geffen over here, you have over here Anav, you have, you have all these things are all over here in all, in all, um, in all equidistant letter skit, all speaking about, about the trees that is referenced to where the trees were created, all in the same area. Okay, so now I want to get to the Holocaust. Um, probably not the best way to say that. Um, but I think you guys understand. I don't, don't want to get to the Holocaust, but I want to speak about the Holocaust. Okay, so now, let's go on to some... You think, oh, look at that, right over here, perfect. Okay, so now they went... By the way, the Holocaust, there's a lot of codes in the Torah written by the Holocaust. I only took a, a, you know, a few because I did, want to, um, I did want to get to other things. The, um, okay, so in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 16 through uh, verse 18. So you look over here, and this... the the, the so Kim over here talk about something very interesting. Not only is it interesting to look at the codes in the Torah, but it's also interesting to look at the context. What is the Torah saying where the code is hidden? Like, what is it talking about over here? So it says over here, Moshe, and Hashem said to Moshe, He says, this nation will go, and it's going to go, and it's going to rise astray after, it's going to go, and it's going to, it's going to go after other deities, other, um, you know, other gods, if we can call it. They're going to violate my... Um, my, they're going to violate my commandment and it's going on and on about what they're going to do if they don't listen to the Torah and then it says over there and Hashem is Astil Panai I'm going to go and hide my face and what happens with that then you're going to have you know, uh, you know, problems obviously so basically it's speaking about when the Jewish people are doing something wrong they're going something away God is going to hide his face and trouble is going to fall out of the Jewish people you look at over here and the equal distant letter skip over here from the Hey of Moshe spells out exactly I'm not saying I think it's 50, uh, 50 um, letters you go it spells out Ha-Sho'ah. Ha-Sho'ah spells out the Holocaust, which means it's in the time when they're going to go. And they're going to stray away after, after me, away from me. There is going to be a destruction in there in secret codes. It's written Ha-Sho'ah, the Holocaust. What's very interesting... Ha-Sho'ah is translated as the Holocaust? Yeah, the Ha-Sho'ah is the, is, the, is the Holocaust. The, um, you know, during the time when the Jewish people were in Germany, you know, the... You know, the reform movement was picking up very strong. The conservative movement was picking up very strong. The, a lot of people were becoming more German than Jewish. And when that happens, the Goyim, the non-Jews, go and make sure that we realize that we are Jews. You know, the second that you try to be too non-Jewish, they'll be like, hold up, buddy. You know, Mr. Goldberg. You know, you are a Jew. I don't care if you married Christine or not, because that's what the, the, you know, the Nazis did. They killed anybody, regardless if you're a Jew from one parent or two parents. They went and they, and they, and they took care of everybody. The... Um, you know, and, and these, you know, this is what happens when we stray away, away from God. Here is also something very interesting. It also speaks about, about the, um, you know, the, 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 the Holocaust. Here is something very interesting. Here, these are all equidistant letters skip. But if you notice, they're not all the same. Which means that they're not all 50. Some of them are zero. Some of them are just straight through. Some of them are 10. Some of them are, are you know, less than that. But what's, what's very interesting about these is that you have so much information in one paragraph. All this information is in the codes, but it's in one paragraph. Now, all of them are all in equal distant letter skip. So you're not going to have, you know, Hasho'ah, a hey over here, and then you're going to get the shin over here, in the, you know, in five letters, and then another seven letters, and so on and so forth. They're all in equal distant letter skip. So let's see what it says over here. Something uh, very interesting over here. We see over here, um, over here, from the hey over here, spells out Hitler. Hitler, I don't need to translate. I think you all know Hitler is Hitler, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, I'll tell you. Um, so I have, you know, my, I have uh, two sisters that live in Israel. And so I have, you know, Israeli, you know, nephews and nieces. And when, after I got married, me and my wife went to Israel. And my, one of my nieces were testing my wife how much Hebrew she knows. So she was saying, Adudat, do you know maze this? You know, and she was saying all different words in English, in, in Hebrew. Does she know what it is? And my wife, you know, was answering them. And then she says, Adudat, which means, do you know, Adudat maze ziplock? Do you know what is a Ziploc? So you're, we're like, yeah, it's called Ziploc in America also, right? So Hitler is Hitler, everything we could, you know, uh, very easily, uh, you know, to under, understand it, right? You know, what, you know how you call a, a, a bus in Israel? Autobus, right? It's more or less the same thing. All right, okay, because that's not Lashon HaKodesh. That's, you know, Hebrew, which you just took it out. So, yeah, it's also in, in Russian. Uh, what? Autobus. Autobus? What's the F doing in there? 
it's, it's probably a backwards, you know, shin where, I don't know what they have over here. <laughs> you know, I tried reading Russian. Oh my gosh. The letters get very confusing. Okay, here we are. I don't know how we got so far. So we have over here Hitler also. And we have over here also um, Auschwitz. You have Auschwitz and Hitler all in the same area, but it's something very interesting. Mishum Chilul HaShabbat. Because on the account of the desecration of Shabbat. Now, I am not God. I cannot say what's the reason that we have the Holocaust. But we do know that people are getting very lax in Shabbat over there. And there was a desecration of Shabbat. Do we know that this is the reason that we have the Holocaust? No, we don't. And no one can say that that is the reason. Can it be a contributing factor? Yes, it can. It's very can because we know Shabbat is one of the most important things that a Jew needs to keep. But it's something very interesting that you have all this stuff hidden in this, in this, particular, uh, in this particular area. <coughs> this is not so clear, but this is AIDS. Um, this code is eight. Uh, the, and where is it speaking about? It's speaking about what the sins that the generation of the flood did before the flood. We know they were very immoral, very immoral. And we see over here, in equal this letter skip, you see, I don't know if you can see. Can you see over here? Can you see the Aleph? You see Aleph Yudalid Samach, AIDS. This is AIDS. And not only that, when you look at the top two, it says over here, Badam Mavet, death by, by the blood. AIDS is transmitted through the blood. Where is it speaking about? It's speaking about the sins that they did, the immoral acts that they, that they did. We are in the before the flood, when the flood was, was destroyed, all speaking about it you know, in uh, you know, this time. So, okay, let's take, a, let's take a pause about this. Now I have to, to, to explain. So when Ripson and, and, and Wheatsum went and they found all this information, the, creator, the creators of, of, you know, of these codes of the, of the program, they went and they sent their data to Statistical Science, a review journal of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, one of the most prestigious uh, journal of statistics in the world. For anybody who reads a journal of statistics, statistics um, congratulations on being uh, you know, the odd one out. And um, No, I'm just kidding. It's, you know, it's, it's for those people that enjoy those, uh, those things. And it's very, very prestigious, uh, one of the most prestigious statistics, statistical journals in the world. Apparently, there's more than one. Okay, so um, now the... They went and they sent this to them to go and to investigate, you know, show this and, you know, publish it in your thing. This is unbelievable stuff. This is stuff that is unheard of. So statistical uh, science went and said, um, very nice, uh, we think you cheated. Like, what do you mean we cheated? He says, there's something that we call hidden failures. Hidden failures means that you went and you showed us so many beautiful results, but you could have tried 10,000 different failed results. And that's where you came. So you found some good ones, but you, found, but you had to get through 10,000 failed ones. Those are called hidden failures. You hide your failures and you show us only a thing. So they said, okay, fine. So tell us what to search for. We'll search for it. And then we'll see. That's not hidden failures. That's we're searching for whatever we're looking for. So they, they proposed an experiment and they agreed on it. The experiment was as follows. The experiment was... We're going to go a little bit over, just a tad bit over, so whoever wants to go. Okay, so now, the, they went and they proposed this experiment. They said, you're going to take 34 rabbis, the rabbis' names, and you're going to find the rabbis' name in equidistant letter skip in the Torah, and you're going to also find the date of birth and the date of death, and you can find them all in close proximity of each other. If you find that, then okay, then we see that you have, you, you know, you have something, you're, you're onto something. So, Random rabbis? No, so how did they pick up the rabbis? So they, they, the original list of rabbis was taken from a book called the Encyclopedia of the Great Men of Israel. So they picked rabbis that had three columns written about them. So people, you know, more of the famous rabbis, they picked those three columns, and they went, and they went to search for them in the, in the Torah. Now they, picked a, they, they went and they found a linguist by the name of Dr. Yaakov Orbach, who established the rules of orthography and how the, the names are going to be written, how it's going to be pronounced, also the form of the Hebrew date. So everything is legit, everything is according to the way that it, that it should be, and they ran the results. And the results looked very, very, very successful. And here's, for example, if I could show you one of them. This, we see over here, this is uh, the, uh, the, you know, Hamarshal. Hamarshal was Rav Shlomo Luria. And we see over here, here you see Hamarshal was an equal distal skip. And the, all this was found. Yud Bet Kislev, which is the date of his death. You have, you know, 53334, which is also corresponding to the year of his death. And his name, Shlomo, which his name was also corresponding, all in the same area, all in equal distal letter skip. This is just an example of what they found amongst the other, uh, the, you know, the other rabbis. So they went, they took all this information, and they sent it to statistical science. Statistical science... Okay. Statistical science was, um, you know, 
hesitant, to say the least, to publish it uh, yet. They, um, you know, because it's a very controversial subject. You're taking a scientific magazine and you're saying, well, hey, there's like heebie-jeebie stuff in the Bible. You know, they're going to be like, all right, you guys are off your rocker. What are you talking about? There's, you know, it's only science. The science is facts. What are you going to say? Start, start saying some heebie-jeebie things over there. But they said, you know, so they felt that their reputation was going to be on the line. But, said, but you know, but, uh, you know, the Weitzman and, and Rip said, that, but, the, but the, you know, the, the math is logic. The, 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 you know, the science is there. It's all there. You know, we, we did what you asked us to do. So they agreed to a compromise. The compromise was that you go and you find one of the world's leading statisticians. If he could sign and validate the results, then we'll publish it. And they picked somebody by the name of Percy Daconis. Percy Daconis, he was, um, he, he in the mid-1970s, he was known as the debunker. He used to expose uh, ESP. E, you know, ESP and also for psychics. You guys know what ESP is? Um, extrasensory perception. I remember one time I was, I was walking with my wife in Manhattan and there was a guy, you know, one of those Asian people that want to do your caricatures. And my wife was pregnant at the time and, you know, he called us over. He's like, he's like uh, you know, so he tried to make the sale, I guess, I don't know, whatever it was. So he's like, he's like oh, you're pregnant. Ah. He's like, you're going to have a beautiful girl, you know. And he's like, I, you know, I'm like, I'm like, how do you know that? So he's like, I have third eye, and, you know. And he actually didn't point over here. I said, very cool, where's your eye located? He's like, my eye located right over here. You know, I have a problem with people talk to me in accent. I sort of respond to an accent. So um, I was like, oh, how you know that? And he's like, I know that because I know everything, you know. And, you know, so we're going back and forth. My wife had a boy afterwards, obviously. So, um, but, you know, we go there. And it's, it's a problem because I speak to people with this, like, Spanish accent. And it's like, you know, it, it comes out. And I didn't even, I can't even hold it. Because I think, like, you, you don't understand me because I'm not speaking your language. But now I speak your language. You understand, right? Uh, you know, so... I, um, I, you know, it's, it's a problem. My wife always is, is, has a field day when I, when I do it. It comes out. It's, I don't know. Um, it's like, and when somebody, when somebody goes and they speak a very, very, let's say someone speaks a very, very heavy Russian accent, right? I feel like I understand Russian. Like, I just felt like I just spoke Russian, right? You know the Russian accent, right? You speak like you have peanut butter and you're talking backwards. Uh, like, Stoya now. You know, like, it's, it's like everything's like working backwards. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Why is it? Why are Russians always angry? I don't know. But it's also Japanese. Japanese are always, you know, like, you walk in, it's like, you know, like, you know, I don't know what just happened over there. Um, you know, he's like, he's like, no, no, he just said, have a good day. I'm like, it sounded like he was shooting guns at me. Right, so it's very interesting. When you, deal at, when you, when you look at the way that people speak in different languages, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, you go, you make, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was a perfect example, speaking to a maid. Yeah. Ella hablo in a refrigerator O. They just throw O at everything. And the clean O with the Windex O. Right? And then it's clean O, spotless O. You know? And they think they're like, I just nailed Spanish. I could be like, a, a, you know, whatever. Okay, let's move on before I get to French. Okay, so now, um, so um, how do we get to this? Oh, yeah, ESP, extrasensory percent. It just reminded me of what happened. The guy who was, uh, you know, the third eye that told me that I was going to have a different child. So um, he, this Percy uh, Diaconis, he was the one, he would debunk these people. Like the people that say that they're psychics, you know, like if you give me $5, I'll read you the future. You know, like I always have some questions. I'm like, if for $5, you're going to read me the future, there's going to be some questions that I have to ask over here. Why is it only $5? And which future are you talking about over here? You know, you can be $20. I'll read your future. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so they put this person, because this person was known to debunk these types of, you know, uh, you know, heebie-jeebie type of things. So Diaconus went and he says, I want you to rerun this experiment with new rabbi, a new list of rabbis. So the, they reran the, the new list. And it was also unbelievable, it was amazing, and it, was, and it worked, and, and it was also, the results were phenomenal. So he said, listen, that's very nice and dandy. I want to run now a control experiment, which means is you picked it in the Torah. I want to run those same names, and they picked, you know, they picked for example, uh, the Hebrew translation of War and Peace, the Hebrew translation of uh, Moby Dick, and they said, run them, maybe we could find them also over there. And then we compare the results, what is the, you know, what is the probability that we have over here? And Moby Dick and War and Peace had nothing on the Torah. Not, like, not even close to, to the results that it showed in the Torah. 
So that kind of still went, he, he made them jump through hoops. He said, no, you're still, and he went and he started jumbling the, the Torah, jumbling the names. You're like, what happens if you, like, so like, he's like, very, because that's, that, that was it. He, he, you know, somebody who goes and wants to debunk anything that's heebie is going to try every single method to try to debunk it. So he went and he tried to say, okay, what happens if you switch names like this? And they had to switch it almost a million different ways, literally a million, like 999,999 different ways. They had to go and peer, peer the names and the dates incorrectly to see maybe you'll find the results also over here. Maybe you find results over here. And the results were astonishing because the results were only in the correct manner and only in the correct thing. And finally, after running the computer through all his hoops and things that he made them jump through, they, uh, that he decided that he was going to go and he was going to write them um, the letter of recommendation. So the, after they got the letter of recommendation, the, scienti- the, stand, you know, the scientific, um, the, um, you know, this, this publishing company said, okay, listen, one more thing we need to know. So they said, we want to know the, 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 the scientific confidence level that you have over here. The scientific confidence level is the, I'll, I'll tell you first of all to explain it, the standard level of confidence um, in, in, you know, in the scientific world is 5%, so it's 1 in 20. What it means is, is that there is less than 1 in 20 chances that the researchers got lucky. Like they want to know the confidence level of how, how accurate are these results or how lucky are these results. So the, the standard one is 1 in 20. The, if let's say you go to the new, journal, uh, the new England Journal of Medicine, where if you deal with something of life and death, so there you would obviously want a more higher level of confidence level, so it would be 1 in 50. Right? So they want to know what is the standard confidence level that we have over here in your thing that you didn't get lucky. So they pulled all the numbers together, they did all the, the math, and it turned out that the results that, they were, that it was a fluke, that it was, it was a lucky, all of it was lucky, was 1 in 62,500. Let me repeat that. The normal one is 1 in 5. The highest one, journal medicine, right, where you deal is 1 in 50. Their, 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 um, their level of confidence was 1 in 62,500. So, in August 1994, this was published in the, in, in the paper. Um, now, when, this is the, the, you know, the mathematical, uh, you know, the, the, the whatever, the statistic one. Yeah. So, this, the created tremendous amount of controversy. People started going, and, and a lot of the scientists started going over this entire data. Is it possible? It's not possible. And they had a lot of critics going against it. And in fact, they went to, to the extent that they sent researchers to the Jewish cemeteries to look at the spelling of the names, that they got the names of the spellings right. They went and they, fi- they went through this with a fine-tooth comb, through the entire data, and guess what? They found five errors. They did, they found five errors. Two of the rabbis' names were misspelled, Two of the dates of death were incorrect, and there was one error in the formula. So Ripa and Wheatsum went, and they redid the entire, the, entire, the entire research, the entire thing, and they came out with the numbers. And they were able to find significantly more. So much so, that the confidence, the new statistical confidence level came out to be 1 in 1.6 million. Which means it's 1,694,000. That was the confidence level that it had. So it went from 1 in 62,000 to 1 in 1.6 million. So, granted, you know why the, the confidence level was so low, and I'm using air quotes for low because obviously it was very high, it was because we didn't have the math right. But now that we had the names right, and the math right, the level of confidence, so the critics thought that they were getting us, and were getting us wrong there, but all it did was increase our results and show that the, the numbers were not only accurate, but they were actually, the confidence level was significantly higher. So, this, you know, was obviously, you know, uh, you know published in, um, you know, in Statistical Science Magazine. The... Here's something very interesting. So this is very interesting because generally we have the idea that you could look for some of the codes, but you could look for it after it happened. Can you look for something in the future? Right? So we could see all these codes but in the past, but can we see something in the future? So um, there was a reporter by the name of Michal Drossen. Right? This reporter went and he, did, he searched, the, I don't know if he searched it or somebody else searched it, for, for Yitzhak Abin. Whoever's not familiar with Yitzhak Abin was a prime minister. He was a, a prime minister in Israel and they searched his name in the Torah. And they found there, not only they found his name in the Torah, but they also found it, that they found in, right over there going across his name was that he will be assassinated. This was a year before he was assassinated. So they went and they pulled out this, um, you know, this thing and they found this information that he was going to be assassinated. So this reporter went and he went to get this information. He wanted to send it over to Yitzhak Abin. He says, listen, this, we did the Torah codes. This is the results we found. We want you to have it. They, it got to Yitzhak Abin. He didn't, he didn't, whatever. He didn't pay too much attention to it. A year later, he was assassinated. So granted, it's... It's true, but they were able to find, they found Saddam Hussein, they found the, the, the tsunami in the, um, 2004, they, have the, they found the Mumbai, they found the murder of Rabbi, you know, Rabbi Bukhatsara, Rabbi Lazar Bukhatsara, they found a lot of things uh, written, you know, hidden inside these codes. The, I thought you're not supposed to use the codes to predict the 
we can't use the code to predict the future because you don't know what to search for. Or to find the future, they just found it. They were able to do it. And that was a, that was not once in a one. They don't. They weren't they were able to find find you know majority of them. Here's for example. This is the twin towers. Um, I, this I want to go through uh, you know fast because it's getting really late. Um, it's actually really late. I apologize. So we see over here. This is an equal. You know, here we have over here for example, pigua. Now again, this is not all equal distant letter skip. All, all the words are the same, but a lot of them are the same, as you see them. But um, the, the, the point here is that you have so much information in one area, all, again, in equal distant letter skip. Now you have over here, for example, pigua, which is a terror attack. Aretzach, uh, which, um, which is murder. You have Hatomim, which is the towers, uh, which Hatomim is, tw- is like the twin. Migdalim towers. You have over here also Ben Laden. You have all this information over here inside the Torah. Uh, you, we also have another one over here. This is actually Saddam. This is referring to Saddam. You see over here Saddam. You see over here Saddam. He will die and will hang like his, like his brothers. All written in, in, the, in the Torah codes over here. Here's another one written about the Twin Towers. Here you see over here, um, you know, Matos is an airplane. Migdale is the towers. Naflu, they fell. Pamain twice. Hippil will take down Hatomim, the towers. Um, and you have over here all the, you know, all the, all the skips that you have over here. So you have the Twin Towers. Anything that you look for, you're able to find it in here. Which is ridiculous, which is crazy. This is another thing about the Twin Towers, but because we're short on time, this is another thing about the Twin Towers, um, but again, we're short on time, so we don't want to go over here. Here, we have over here Hanukkah. What's interesting over here is Hanukkah, you have over here so much information written, thank you, so much information is written here about Hanukkah, all in the same area. You have the Hanukkah candle, the menorah, the night, the, you know, the, the miracle of the 25th, and so on and so forth. We could go on and on with all this information over here. Okay. Um, I did skip one over here, and this is something that we spoke about before. So we did speak about, I want to finish off with two things that we did speak about before in previous classes. Um, and let's see if I'm able to pull it out over here. Let's find it. Oh, no, I didn't. I thought I had over here the Christianity one and Islam one. But maybe... Oh, here we go. In Devarim, in Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 26 to verse 27. So, here it speaks about, right, God is going to go and spread you out. in the You're going to be low in number. This is speaking about, again, we're not going to listen. We're going to go into exile. You're going to be low in number. We're going to be spread out the entire world. This we spoke about in one of the classes. This is what very interesting. And look at the difference in the colors, right? So, the colors, what you're looking at over here. The... I want to say red, but I know it's wrong. It's maroon. Okay, maroon, right? I was going to say maroon or magenta. Am I right? Um, magenta is not red? Okay, whatever. All right. All right, so you have a maroon, all right? Okay, so you look at the maroon color over here. You have over here an equal distant letter skip, Mecca. Mecca, it, where, where it says that you're going to go and you're going to be spread out the entire world. You're going to be in exile, has an equal Mecca skip, Mecca. Mecca is what? Is referring to Islam. You go in equal letter skip, it's also the same equal, equal distant letter skip, of in the green. That's green, right? Light green? Right, okay, I don't know. Baby grass? I don't know. Um, lime, okay. So it says over here, Yeshu, which is a reference to uh, Christianity. The two exiles that we're in now, and in fact, for the, we, that we've been for the, more or less in the past, you know, almost 2,000 years, roughly speaking, is written in the, in, in the Torah where it says that you're going to be in exile, where it says that you're going to be spread out throughout the entire, uh, the entire world. Here, okay, and here is the final thing. Is that, that the, the same thing as, as the Holocaust? No, different verse. Different verse, yeah. Different, different psukim. So here we have over here, this is in Migilat Estel. So... What's interesting about this, and this we spoke about when we spoke about Purim, but I, I, it's easier now that I have a screen, I wanted to, to show you, it's much easier to visualize these things. So, um, I really hope they're able to see it. If they're seeing it backwards, oh yeah. Okay, so, um, the, you know, the idea behind, behind this was that Esther went and she asked Ahasuerus to go and hang, you know, the ten sons of Haman, you know, Machar, to tomorrow. The problem was that they were already dead. Why are we going and we're asking to hang them again if it was dead. Now, when it says machal, it's a reference to something in the distant, far distant future. And, in fact, when we look at, at the, the ten sons of Haman, that they were indeed, and the king says, yeah, you can. And we know the king sometimes, is, when it's referring to the, in, in the Megillah, it's referring to actually God. God is not written in the Megillah, it's referring to when it says the king. So it's something very interesting. When you look at the ten sons of Haman, there's some letters, there's three letters that are written in small, there's one letter that are written in big. So you see over here, the top is written in small. You hear, see over here the shin, and you see over here the zayin is written in small. So you have over here the numerical value of, of Shin, Zion, and Taf is 707. You have over here the Vav is very big, which is, this is very unlikely. You don't see them. The, the letters have to be exactly the same on the line. And you see the parchment. You can even see the parchment over here. You see the parchment? This is where the letters have to touch. 
So for example, the yud goes on the top, but the letters have to touch both the top and the bottom of those lines of the parchment, because that's how, you know, whatever, the part of the, of, uh, the, the, the way that you write the Torah. So now, over here we see something very odd. You have here three letters that are short, and one letter that is extra long. What's interesting over here is you take out the letters that are short, like equal 707. You take the letter that's big, that's six. Six, what's the six, uh, the, you're talking about um, the six... Millennium? Is that my, yeah, the sixth millennium is the, the year 5000. You take the, the year 5000, you take a 5707, it comes out to the year 1946. 1946 is where we had the Nuremberg trials. The Nuremberg trials, we had 10 Nazis that were hung. Not only the 10 Nazis were hung, there was something very interesting. Um, there was a Nazi, and what was his name? His name was, um, his name was Julius Streicher. Right? Um, I had to do that because um, we didn't do the German accent. Right? So we have over here uh, the Julius Strache. You know, so we have over here the, um, the, the, you know, the, one of the Nazis. What he screamed on the way to being, the, ten of them got hung on the gallows. Ten Nazi Nazis, uh, Nazi Nazis were hung in the gall- gallows. This uh, Julius Strache, when he got, to, he for some reason screamed out, Purim Feast 1946. No one knows why. It's documented in a Newsweek magazine. Was it Newsweek magazine? Yeah, Newsweek magazine. All right, if you want to look it up, it's October 28th, 1946, page 46. It says that Purim Feast, what does he bring with Purim Feast? What did he have to do with it? But there's something even more interesting. There were actually 11 Nazis that were going to be hung. But only 10 of them were hung because one of them, by the name of Hermann Goring, committed suicide in his cell. Now, what is known about Hermann Goring, that he was a cross-dresser. Now, we know that Haman had 10 sons that died during Purim, but he also had a daughter that committed suicide, that jumped off the ledge. And Hermann Goring was the 11th one. He was a cross-dresser. Put the two and two, you know, putting them together. So you have over here that Esther asked, I says, I want them to be, be hung tomorrow. What's tomorrow? Why are they being hung? They're dead already. So tomorrow is talking about the diff, far distant future. Somewhere in the future, you're going to have the Nazis. For, you know, there's many different interpretations how it's Amalek comes from Haman. Also, the same idea are going to go, are going to be, are going to be hung in the future. And they have it all over here, all in the codes and written in the date that it's going to be in the letters that are small and the letters, uh, you know. 1946, yeah. We see over here a very interesting, very interesting ideas. We see over here that there's so many. And by the way, this is this is just a little bit. You go and there is people that are go that, that go in depth in it. There's books on the Torah codes. There are so many different things that you're able to find in the Torah codes. We just touch just the you know the you know the the, the brief version of it just to show you because again this is not a whole idea about you know showing the, all the Torah codes. This just shows you that it's impossible, and I say that with confidence, that it's 100% impossible for anybody, I don't care how smart you are, how much computer advance you have, you have to know this information, to put this information in the Torah. Because not only are these so magnificent and equal distant letter skip, but you also have things that didn't even happen yet. You have the Rambam, you have the, 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 the Shoah, the Holocaust, you have so many things that didn't even happen yet you, that, are, that are hidden in the Torah. There is no way that somebody could rationally say, after seeing all this, that yeah, this Torah was made up. This Torah was not brought by God. This Torah was 100% brought by God, and this is further proof that the Torah is divine, and there is one God, one Creator, who gave us the Torah, and who was able to put, because only a God who has all the divine knowledge was able to put this information inside over here. Any questions? Yes. I think I once mentioned this to the same friend who is... Yeah, we're still waiting for that class. Um, <laughs> she doesn't want to call. She says she's happy where she is, but I don't know. Oh, uh, she, she yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, she's, I think she said something about how, like, same thing can be done with the Old and New Testaments? Oh, 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 actually, excellent that you said that. So they actually, there's about a bunch of skeptics that they went and they did this with like Moby Dick in the English version. They're like, oh, well, you see over here? We found over here, it says over here, Julius, you know, whatever. I don't know, Beethoven, you know, whatever. Not Julius Beethoven. So you could find, you could find quotes in any book. That's not, that's not something, but the volume that we have in the Torah codes. And not only that, the letter skip and future knowledge and you have things that are related to the text itself that you don't find anywhere. The New Testament, first of all, you're going to have good luck figuring out which version you're going to pick after all the 40,000 different versions that they have. But if you find the version that you're going to do, you're not going to be able to find anything, compare, nothing even close. Now again, this is where the level of confidence that you could go. Go check the level of confidence that they have over there versus what we have. Well. Nothing is comparable. It's possible. You can find anything. You go to the New York Times. Can you find Moses, you know, brought down the Torah in equal distant letter skip if you search through all the editions of the New York Times in equal distant letter skip up, I don't know, 50? Very possible, because there's so many, just, you know, statistically speaking, the probability of it, it's, the more that you have, the more you'll, you'll be able to find anything. But 
the, the likelihood that you're going to find something. And it's going to be an equal distance letter skip. And it's going to speak about the same area. Imagine you find Moses and he, you know, when it speaks about the Jews in Israel. Like that's very, very unlikely. And that's very, very, you know, not possible that it that will happen. Can it happen? Yeah. But the amount that we have over here. And the amount that we have. And this, what, what's really cool about the statistical, you know, science magazine is that this validates everything. It'd be like, okay, some Jewish rabbi decided to do this and there. No one's actually tested it. If it went in that magazine, you know it was tested. And that's why I specifically went through that whole history of why I said that. To show you that they don't say that about, you know, the, I don't know, any, you know, any other book. They don't say that about the, you know, the Book of Mormon. They don't say that about the New Testament. They only say that about the, you know, about the Torah. What? Well, statistical science magazine. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, if Esther was saying to Amish that she wants the sons to be like leader, and but she was referring to the Holocaust, then why would she say that Who said that she said Achavashrosh? She was asking the king. The king can refer to God. Anybody else? No other questions? No other questions on camera? Going once, going twice. Okay. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.